All right, if you would open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we have spent the last three Sunday mornings and the past two Wednesday nights looking at the five problem churches um, in the book of Revelation, the five churches that had issues that Jesus had to address. We had the three churches that had the heart problems, which was the church of Ephesus, the church of Sardis, and the church of Laodicea. And then we had the two churches that had compromise problems, the church of Pergamos and Thyatira. And tonight we switch gears. And tonight and tomorrow, we'll finish up uh, looking at the letters to the churches. And in the two churches that we're looking at tonight and then on Sunday, uh, these were two churches that didn't have any problems that Jesus addresses. It doesn't mean they were perfect churches, but it just means that there wasn't any blatant thing that Jesus had to, you know, point out or rebuke them for. So neither the church of Smyrna, which we're going to look at tonight, nor the church of Philadelphia, which we'll look at on Sunday, received rebukes from Jesus. And so two noteworthy churches. And uh, let's read here beginning in verse eight of chapter two. It says, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are, are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches and he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you tonight in the name of your son, Jesus, and we thank you so much, Lord, for these letters that you wrote to these churches that reflect for us your heart, not just your heart for these churches, these seven churches that were literal churches there in the first century in Asia Minor, but also for our lives as believers today. We know there's much that we can glean from these letters. And Lord, I also want to pray tonight for our missionary focus, uh, the Williamson family. Thank you, Lord, for 20 years of marriage for Danny and Michelle. And just the blessing, Lord, that that couple has been to so many, including many here for the time that they spent here and, and Lord, I just thank you that we're actually getting a chance to see them in a few weeks, that they'll be out here with our body, and thank you for that. And just thank you for the way their kids are growing and maturing in life and in the relationship with you. And Lord, we pray just for continued blessing and fruit to abound um, in Danny's ministry involvement in Uganda and his ministry with Jeremy Camp in the Philippines. Thank you, Lord, for just the way that you are using their lives, um, not just in Tennessee, but around the globe. And we pray that you would continue to cause them to be fruitful. And tonight we ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us as we unpack the scriptures tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So the church of Smyrna receives from Jesus the shortest of the letters. And so the shortest letter goes to the suffering church and the persecuted church. And I find it very interesting that the letter with the most continuous tone of praise from Jesus is addressed to those who suffered the most and possessed the least. 
It's an interesting thing to know. What a, what a contrast to the church that we looked at on Sunday when my friend Cody was here. Did you guys enjoy Cody on Sunday? Um, love that brother. But as he took you through the church of Laodicea, we saw that, that Laodicea was this church with great physical wealth, but they were spiritual paupers. Jesus said of that church, you say that you're rich, that's your perspective, but when I look at you, you're poor, blind, wretched, and naked. And I think this really speaks volumes to us today regarding the true value of the church. You see, today in many, many cases, especially here in America, the church has become about being the biggest and the greatest. It's, it's become about possessing material affluence rather than spiritual influence. It's, it's become about worldly riches rather than heavenly resources. In much of the church today, it's become about leading people to be impressed with the church rather than leaving them with a lasting impression of Jesus. You know, it's not about buildings and bank accounts. It's not about a church's ability to wow a crowd or impress, you know, movers and shakers. That's not the kind of church that Jesus takes note of. No, what Jesus takes note of is the church that's faithful. And Smyrna was a wonderful example of that. Let's begin by talking tonight about the city, just to give some context of where this church was at. The city of Smyrna was a coastal trading hub located in the Roman province of Asia. Once again, we have our map, and it shows you, you know, the various churches. It was about 35 miles from the church of Ephesus. And today, the church of Smyrna actually still exists. It's a city in Turkey, the city of Isma, the city of Ismar, and it was in an area that was heavily populated by Jewish people who at the time of this writing hated Christians, and it was also populated by a bunch of Romans who also hated Christians, which made Smyrna a very difficult place to be a Christian. And it's interesting, the word Smyrna comes from the word myrrh, and myrrh was a fragrance that was used as, in taking an embalming spice, and as it was crushed, it would create this fragrance that was known in that day of, as myrrh that they would use in an embalming dead bodies. The city of, of Smyrna was founded about a thousand years before Jesus walked the earth, and it was destroyed in 600 BC by the Lydians, but then around the time of Alexander the Great, one of Alexander the Great's generals sought to rebuild the city and make it one of the greatest cities in Asia Minor. It was actually the first planned community in the entire world. It had streets designed with, that would funnel the wind, and, and it had uh, a convenient water sources. And so it was this very well-thought-out city and very, very beautiful city. And by the first century, Smyrna was a great ally to Rome. In fact, Smyrna was the center, kind of the epicenter of emperor worship or Caesar worship. And though there were many temples in Smyrna to the various gods, the largest temple was built to Caesar, the ruler of Rome, in AD 26. And that was actually during the life of Christ. It was in Smyrna that it was, that, that it was first a capital crime to not worship the current ruler as a god. It was in Smyrna that they began, you know, this, this speech or this saying that Caesar is Lord. And so I want you just to imagine that you're a Christian living in that city during that time. And, you know, it would be a, a place where it would be really, really hard to stand for Jesus. And when you wouldn't say that Caesar was Lord, it could cost you your job, it could cost you your land, it could cost you your possessions. So to these people living in those conditions, Jesus writes a letter that deals directly with suffering and persecution. And that makes it an important letter for us to consider tonight. 
Our outline for looking at the letter will be, um, will follow this outline. We're going to look as we always have. Jesus addresses himself to each one of these churches with a revelation of himself that is directly connected to the vision that John had of Jesus in chapter 1. And then we're going to look at what Jesus knows about this church. And then we're going to look at what Jesus exhorts, how he exhorts the church. And then we're going to look at what Jesus promises the church. And so that'll be our outline for this evening. We begin with the revelation of Jesus, and it was G. Campbell Morgan who once said this, the supreme need in every hour of difficulty and depression is a vision of Jesus. How many of you know that to be true? The supreme need in any hour of difficulty is a a vision, a connection that we would see Jesus clearly. In fact, it reminds me of um, a church where behind the pulpit was the stained glass uh, window, and, and in the stained glass window, it was a picture of Jesus. The pastor, though, was like a giant man. He was like six, seven, and he would, you know, stand there, and if you were sitting in the first few, few, few rows and, and looking, you know, up at the, the, the stage and at the pastor, he was so big that he blocked the view of Jesus, and so one day, some little boy was in church with his mom, and he was sitting in the front row, and they had a guest speaker who was a very little man. He was a short little guy, and the, and the little boy leans over to his mom and says, hey, mom, where's the guy that never lets us see Jesus? <laughs> That's not what you want as, uh, to have if you're a pastor. No, you want to be, you know, directing. I know uh, of a pulpit a church where they have right here on the pulpit, it says that we would see Jesus, and that is always, always the key. And especially we need to see him in times of difficulty. So Jesus identifies himself to this suffering church in this way. These things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. He begins by speaking of his nature, that he is the first and the last. And it's interesting that we see this same title was used um, of God in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. It says, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, so God is speaking, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. So Jesus uses this same phrase taking out of or taking there from Isaiah chapter 44. And to us, this might, you know, be, we might not catch this at first, but to any Jewish person, you know, listening to this and reading this, they immediately would understand that this was a claim that Jesus was making to be God. That this was an announcement, a declaration of his deity. And this is one of the many places in scripture where we see Jesus identifying himself as God, and the, the eternal God. And it's important that we make note of that. But then he also adds this, who was dead and came to life. And this alludes to his resurrection, And so in this little revelation that Jesus gives to this church, we actually have a beautiful picture of the gospel. That God, the eternal one, takes the form of a man and then comes to this earth so that he might die on the cross to pay the price for our sins, which is exactly what Jesus did. But Jesus didn't stay dead. No, three days later, he comes back to life and he claims his victory over the grave, his victory over death. So in this letter, Jesus introduces himself as the eternal God, the one who holds power over death. And you know, this is a great picture for anyone to have, especially those who are struggling in trials, that Jesus is the eternal God, the one who transcends time and space. That means that he is greater than anything that you and I might find ourselves going through. It also declares here that he is able to overcome what you are up against because he's the one who overcame sin and death. 
And that's why Paul would write in the book of Romans that you and I can be more than conquerors through him, Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us. And isn't it comforting, church, to note that the very same power that brought Jesus Christ forth from the grave, that Paul the Apostle says, that power is in us. Isn't that an amazing thing to think about? That the power, the very power that brought Jesus forth from the grave is available to you and I to walk in victory for Jesus and to be overcomers in this world. In other words, we have a suffer, a savior who can identify with our suffering because he was one of us, but he also gives us the hope that we can have a future glory. So the revelation of Jesus to this church, he identifies himself as the first and the last, the one who was dead and who came to life. And that brings us then to what Jesus knows. Look at verse nine. It's what he knows about this church. I know, everybody say no. I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are, but are, uh, are a synagogue of Satan. He says he knows their works. And once again, like we've seen in the other uh, letters, as Jesus says this to each one of them, I know your works. This speaks of those practical things that were done for Christ. Those practical things that were done in their church and in their city in the name of Jesus. And you know, sometimes... When we are seeking to serve the Lord, when we're involved in you know, practical service for the Lord, especially things that can go kind of be unseen. And a lot of you do that. A lot of you serve in ways, be it in your home or be it in the church, that, that others don't see. Know this, Jesus sees. Jesus sees that. It never, ever is out of his sight. In fact, Jesus says this, that, that anyone who would give a cup of cold water to a little child in his name, there would be a reward for them. If that's not a motivation to sign up for children's ministry, I don't know what it is, you know? <laughs> if I just give some water to, to the kids, like, wow, that's amazing. There's a spiritual reward for that? It's incredible. He knows their works. Guys, know this. Jesus takes personal interest in everything that his people and his churches do in his name. He sees it. So you might not be getting the pat on the back from others around you, but Jesus sees. Jesus knows. You know, one of our core values here is this, and I, and I hope you have grabbed a hold of this. I mean, we try to live this out as a church, that core value of that we believe we've been blessed to be a blessing. And so we look for ways that we can be involved in different parts of the world and we can come along um, inside other churches and, and we can do you know, different things for the kingdom that we can take what God has given to us and bless others. And as you live that out in your life in just a practical way and seeking to be a blessing to those around you, Jesus sees that. He makes note of that. He's blessed by that. But you know what's interesting there's a mindset today among some ministers who, who kind of imply that it's wrong or sinful to be busy. This church was busy, busy in serving the Lord. And, and I'll say this, that I think it is, it's, it is wrong for us to neglect our families. You shouldn't put your serving Jesus above your families. And obviously, we, we shouldn't ever neglect our relationship with the Lord. We could, shouldn't put service. A lot of people get you know, too focused on the ministry that they forget about the master, and we don't want to do that either. But being busy for the kingdom of God is not something that is wrong. It's something that Jesus takes note of, especially when we're doing it with the right motives. And Jesus knows the quality, the quantity, and the value of our works. And when our motives are right, he rewards us. In fact, listen how Paul put this. He says, for there is no other, found, no other foundation can anyone lay 
than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. He's the focus. Simply Jesus. He's the, it's all about him. It's all about him. It's all for him. And it's all through him. That's our, our motto here. He's the foundation. But he says this. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, each one's works will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's works of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through fire. So he says that, that our, the, our works that we're doing for Jesus get, get judged. The motive is what gets judged. And if it's a good motive, it's the right motive. It's like gold, silver, or stone that doesn't burn up in the fire. But if our motive is wrong, if our motive is, oh, I want people to see me or, oh, I want people to think I'm spiritual or, or oh, I want that pat on the back or, oh, this is going to make me feel good about myself. If the motive motive is wrong, then it's like wood, hay, or stubble that burns up. In other words, there's no reward. There's no heavenly reward. But if the motive is right and Jesus sees it, he chalks it up in, in your account in heaven as a spiritual reward. Remember, Jesus said, hey, don't lay up treasures on earth where rot, moth and rust you know, could destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And we do that as we engage ourselves in the work of Jesus Christ. So he knew their works. Secondly, he knew their tribulation. Now this isn't referring to the great tribulation that we'll read about um, when we get into chapter six of the book of Revelation. But this word tribulation means a crushing or a pressure. It speaks of being pressed Together, It's that crushing of that spice that creates that, that aroma of myrrh. And you could say that Jesus, choosing Jesus, added to the pressure that these people were living under there in Smyrna. Because they wouldn't say, Caesar is Lord, they were putting their lives in danger. And as I said, many of them were losing their jobs. They would lose their lambs, lands, lambs too. But uh, they, they would lose their lands, they would lose their possessions, and many of them, they were in danger of losing their lives. Now here in America, we, we don't experience this kind of persecution yet. We might should the Lord tarry the way things are going? We might experience this. But even now, your choice to follow Christ can create in your life tension. How many of you have experienced that tension for following Jesus? Tension in your family. And that happens anytime that you are choosing to follow Jesus, you're choosing a way that is contrary to the system of this world, a system that is seeking to press and mold us into a certain image and into a certain system. And it's pressing, isn't it? It's pressing even you know, harder than maybe ever before. It's pressing, our world is. You know, here's a promise that no one likes to claim. 2 Peter 3.12 says that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's not a promise that a lot of people have on the refrigerator. But maybe we should start putting it on our refrigerator, the way things are going, right? That we should like say, okay, this is what Jesus said. All who desire to live godly are going to suffer persecution. G.K. Chesterton, a great theologian, said this. Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, absolutely happy, and in constant trouble. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you guys will be completely fearless, fear not, incredibly happy, abundant life, and in constant trouble. <laughs> And when you make a decision to live for Jesus, there will always be pressure coming from somewhere. 
always be oppressing. There'll be that pressure for you to compromise your beliefs. You'll find pressure and trouble when you stand up for the truth and for, for light and for righteousness and in an environment that hates all of the above. So here's an application. Here's a question. Here's something for us to consider. Could our convictions of righteousness and a desire to stand for righteousness get us in trouble in the courts? Could our stand on the right for the unborn to live get us in trouble in the courts? Or our unwillingness to acknowledge the secular culture's definition of gender and sexuality and marriage, could that get us in trouble one day in the courts? I think as we continue to make stands for those type of things, it's happening already. People are experiencing trouble in the workplace, in their neighborhoods, amongst their family, and amongst their friends. I don't think he would mind me mentioning this to you, but I was talking with our mayor a few months ago. And you know, the city council at Vista just recently, um, back in May, made a decision to fly the pride flag at City Hall. And our mayor, who is a Christian, and a, a good man who loves Jesus, he made a decision that he was not going to vote, that he was going to um, not vote in favor of that. He was the only city council member who did. And he was talking to one of the other city council members, one who I, I think actually even professes to be a Christian, and he, he said, you know, hey, I just need to let you know I'm not going to vote in favor of flying the pride flag. And that guy responded to him by saying, oh, that's okay, I'll just tell my daughter that you hate her because his daughter is a, a lesbian. But that's the type of mentality that we live in today, isn't it? You know, that's the type of mentality that we have today. And, you know, it's sad but that's the type of thing that, that we're up against, that, that even every stand for righteousness like that gets misinterpreted, that, oh, you hate. No, no, no. I'm just standing for what God says in his word is true. And the Bible says, and we need to remember this, church, I said this a few weeks ago, that we need to speak the truth, but we need to speak it in love. That's the that's the the thing that we just have to continue and continue to reinforce. But we are living in a culture that is becoming more and more hostile to the truth of God's word. Could that result for us in trouble on many, many levels? And my question would be, are you ready for that? Are you ready? Are you ready for the trouble that could come should the Lord tarry the way things are going in this world in which we are living? So for the believers in this church, this tribulation that they were encountering, it, it resulted in disdain, it resulted in the loss of uh, jobs and lands, it resulted in persecution, and it also, it resulted in poverty because of losing their jobs. And so the third, third thing Jesus says that he knows about them is their poverty. And Jesus tells this church that he knows that they are poor, but then in parentheses, so, so to speak, he says, but you are rich. Isn't it interesting how God's economy works so differently than ours? You can be the poorest family on your block. And some of you are going, yep, that's me. <laughs> but you can have riches beyond compare because you have Jesus. Because you have Jesus. You see, the faith and commitment of the church in Smyrna that it was that they were not dependent on their wealth or their ease or their life. On the contrary, they were poor and persecuted, but their faith increased all the more. And so Jesus says, hey, you guys, you're rich. You're rich in my eyes. You're rich in faith. You're rich in works. You know, Paul wrote to Timothy these words in 1 
Timothy chapter 6. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good and that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. You know, sometimes it can be really, really difficult for people who have a lot to be rich in faith. Because they can write a check. Because it's so easy for them to buy or provide for whatever the need might be. But man, when you don't have that, when, when you're lacking, I mean, it's, it's so different because then you are prone to be dependent upon God. You ever go to a third world country where medicines aren't readily available. I've been in places like this, and people get a headache, or they get a cold, or they you know, get some type of thing that we today would look at as a minor illness. They pray, and they pray fervently, because they don't have anything else, but they have everything. And so that's why you can look and go, you know, oh, they're poor, but they're so rich. They're so rich in faith. And if you've ever had a chance to go to a third world country, you guys know if you've been there, don't they just blow you away? Don't those people just blow your mind because they have so little and yet they're so happy and they're so contented because they realize they have everything in the reality that they have Jesus. And listen, if you are not rich in Christ, you will never be rich with anything else, regardless of how much you possess physically. That reminds me of the story of that rich, that farmer who built, you know, had such a bumper crop. I mean, he had this one year, the crop came in, it was so big. Imagine this, this crop was so big. He's hauling it in, and it's like, it's too much for his barn. He has to tear down his barn and build a bigger barn because that's what a bumper crop he had that year. He gets everything harvested, everything in his barn. He's kicking back on his porch, you know, drinking a cup of coffee and just celebrating, thinking, you know, man, I've got it made. You know, he says to his soul, eat, drink, and, and be merry. I mean, you, you, you're, you, you're set. And the Lord comes to him that night and says, you're a fool. Because this night, your soul is required of you, and you're not rich toward God. Guys, we need to be rich toward God more than anything else. The church in Smyrna was rich toward God. So Jesus, he knew their works, their tribulation, and their poverty. Number four, he knew that they were being persecuted by the Jews. Jesus says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, this is interesting because in the first century, Judaism was ex the, an accepted religion by Rome, by Rome. However, after AD 70, when the Romans came in and burnt Jerusalem to the ground, and remember, Revelation is written in AD 96, the tide and the attitude toward the Jewish people changed dramatically, and they were being persecuted by the Romans. And so some Jews in Smyrna saw the Christians as an opportunity to kind of get the pressure off of their backs. And so they started spreading these smear campaigns, these excuse me, rumors about the Christians. And so we know from early literature that because the Christians talked about eating and drinking the blood of Christ when they participated in communion, that the rumor went around was, hey, they, they're, they're eating, drinking blood. They're, they're cannibals. That was one of the lies that was being spread. So you can imagine the reaction, like, I'm a Christian. Hey, I'm a Christian. 
It's one of those cannibals. Kids, get away, you know, like they're going to eat us. I mean, that was one of the things that was going around. And because they refused to visit the pagan temples, they refused to bow to the emperor worship and the pagan gods, they were called atheists because they refused to believe in those gods. And because the Christians often talked about being, uh, being members of one another and loving one another, the, the lies that were being spread about them was that they were engaging in all of these sexual orgies and that sort of thing. So imagine this, okay, they're atheists, they're cannibals, they're into orgies and that type of thing. That was the picture uh, that was being spread of the Christians. And so there was this great disdain and persecution on the Christians in the world at that time. And in Smyrna, it came from these false Jews. They were descendants, physical descendants of Abraham, and they had a synagogue there in Smyrna where the Jews would meet and congregate to you know, supposedly worship God. But Jesus referred to them as being from the synagogue of Satan. That although they professed faith in God, he said they were actually instruments of the devil. And I find it very interesting that Jesus says that these, these who say they are Jews, but they are not. It's an interesting statement. Because you see, Jews or Israelis are a separated people. Most of you know the name Israel came from the time when Jacob was running from his brother. Jacob had burnt all his bridges. Jacob was a deceiver, a conniver, a guy who was just, you know, always looking to get ahead by taking advantage of somebody else. And he had done that with his uncle. He'd done that with his brother. And when he had burned all of his bridges and he hears his brother is coming, you know, toward where he's camped with 400 men. And Jacob is thinking, okay, he's not coming to give me a hug. He's coming to, you know, kill us that Jacob finds himself wrestling with someone all night. Somebody comes into the camp or outside the camp and he meets this individual, this person. He doesn't know who it is and they're wrestling and he's fighting with them all night long and as daybreak is coming, he, he says, you know, I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me. Well, Jacob didn't know that he was wrestling with the Lord. And right at that moment, the Lord shows him who he really is. He shows him that, you know, you think you've been wrestling with me? You think you, you almost got the best of me? I'm gonna show you how powerful I am. And just with one finger, just touches Jacob's hip and it knocks it out of socket. Now Jacob is walking with a limp. He's gonna walk with a limp the rest of his life. But the, but the Lord says to him, he first asks him, hey, what's your name? He knew his name. But Jacob, what he was asking Jacob to do was to make a confession. Because his name meant deceiver, supplanter, heel catcher, one who takes advantage of others. And he says, I'm Jacob. And he says, no more. From now on, your name's going to be Israel. The name Israel means governed by God. And that's what God wanted to, the, to be the, the hallmark, to be the, the, the imprint of all the nation of Israel, that they would be a people that were governed by God. But these people, oh, they're spreading these horrible lies. They're saying these horrible things. And though they were physically and ethically Jews, Jesus says they're not Jews at all. They're not governed by God. They're actually instruments of the devil. And remember Paul the Apostle taught in Romans chapter 2, verse 28. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but inwardly. Jesus says, hey, the issue, it's all about the heart. So those who are governed by God, in God's eyes, are the real Jews, the people of Israel. That doesn't mean that the church has replaced Israel. I'm not saying that, but it's, Paul was talking about something else, that, that a, a real Jew in God's eye, a real person governed by God is somebody who is sold out to him. And I think that's, we can apply that to the Christian life as well. Because the word Christian literally means Christ-like. In fact, did you know that 
The term Christian was first used in the city of Antioch, and it wasn't a compliment. When the people of Antioch were getting fed up with the the Christians because they were so different in the way that they lived and they were standing against the evil, this is what they said. Those guys, they remind us of Jesus. They're those Christians. They're Christ-like. They remind us of Jesus. And so it doesn't, you know, coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Being a Christian is giving your life to Jesus and seeking to live for Jesus. So Jesus comes and he speaks to this church of what he knows about them. And then we see what Jesus exhorts in verse 10. He says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. The first thing he says, this is how he exhorts them, don't fear. Do you know that that phrase is used 129 times in the Bible? Fear not. 129 times in the Bible. But it's interesting that the natural human reaction to suffering is fear right? I mean, when you know that the doctor says we're going to have to operate, what happens? Fear. Like, oh, I don't want to cut me open. You know, I don't want to go through that. It's our first reaction. If you go somewhere where you know that you could possibly get assaulted, there's fear. There's fear that grabs your hearts. I remember, (laughs) maybe it's because he wasn't going, but I remember when I was invited to go and speak at a conference in Yugoslavia, and it was just after the fall of, um, you know, communism, a couple years after that, and there was a civil war going on in the nation of, of Yugoslavia, And to the point that Yugoslavia doesn't exist anymore. Now it's Serbia and Croatia and one other um, country that make up uh, what used to be Yugoslavia. And a friend of mine who was supposed to go on this trip with me, we were at a pastor's conference and he he says, because he was afraid. He was like, and I was concerned. I mean, I was like, you know, they closed the American embassy. They're telling all the Americans to get out of the country and and, and we're going to fly over into the country. Like, that doesn't sound very smart, right? That doesn't sound like a wise thing to do. So we're at a pastor's conference and my friend says, let's go ask Pastor Chuck what he thinks. We walk out to Pastor Chuck, and my friend says, hey, you know, we're supposed to go to Yugoslavia next month, and you know what's going on there? Like, what do you think? He's like, oh, you guys are going to have a great time. <laughs> That's like I said, maybe it's because he wasn't going, you know? He was like, yeah, go for it, you know, kind of a thing. But, but oftentimes, I mean, that's, that's what happens. And fear wants to control us. It was Alan Redpath who said the greatest, and fear is the greatest enemy of our faith. Fear wants to control us. Fear wants to call the shots so that our ultimate goal, fear wants this to be our ultimate goal, that that we avoid all sense or places where we could suffer. Well, if we live that way today, that means I'm not going to stand, right? If I'm living in fear, it means I can't make a stand because this might happen. So this church is living in the midst of that. They're living in the midst of this suffering that's coming down upon them. And Jesus says, hey, you can tell your fear to get in its rightful place. That it doesn't belong here because although the subject of their fear was a reality, their savior was an even greater reality. And Jesus would say, greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Jesus would say, hey, in this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But notice, Jesus flat out tells them, the devil is going to throw some of you into prison. And some of you might even die. And you know, just the thought of this causes a sense of fear to well up within us. 
But here's the thing about following Christ. He's never going to allow you to go through something that he isn't going to also supply you with, you with what you need to get through it as you're following him. And this is the thing, I just want to encourage you in this. Because a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll think like this, and I know other people, they'll, they'll think, they'll hear about maybe what's going on in some other place, and they think, man, if that was happening here, I, I don't know if I could stand. And I love the story that Corey Ten Boom, that great woman who, when she was a little girl, her family was hiding Jewish people in Nazi Germany. And it was getting really intense. And German people that were hiding Jews were being arrested and even being killed. And Corey said to her, Dad, Dad, if I got caught, I just don't know if I, if I could be able to stand. And he said this to her. I love this analogy. He said, Corey, when we're going on a trip on the train, when do I give you the ticket for the train? Do I give it to you weeks or months in advance? And she goes, no, because I'd probably lose it. And he goes, yeah, that's, that's right. But when do I give it to you? And she said, the day of. And, you know, that's how it works with God. A lot of times we can sit there and say, I don't know if I could stand. And, and he's saying, don't worry. When the time comes, I'm going to give you what, you what you need to stand. When the time comes, when that time comes, you're living for Jesus now. Time comes, he'll give you what you need to stand for him. So Jesus tells this church to not fear. But then he also says this, and you will have tribulation 10 days. What does that mean? Not sure, to be honest. Could be a literal 10 days. Some people think it's just speaking of a limited, predetermined time that was only known by the Lord. 10 days in the Old Testament phrasing uh, is used of short periods of time in Genesis 24, 55, 1 Samuel 25, 38, Jeremiah 42, verse 7. All, all passages where 10 days was used figuratively as a short period of time. But others believe that the 10 days might refer to 10 periods of persecution that the church went through under the reign of of Rome, and how there were literally 10 Roman emperors who persecuted the church for about 200 years, beginning with Domitian in 96 AD and ending with Diocletian, the worst of, of, of all of the emperors, in, uh, he reigned from 303 to 313 AD. And it was during that time, it was called the Age of the Martyrs, and the church suffered greatly. The church, many, many Christians during that time were crucified. Some of them were torn apart on the racks where they would stretch them to death. Some Christians had their fingernails pulled off as a form of torture. Others were hung by their thumbs, oftentimes for days. Some of the Christians were wrapped in animal skins and thrown out for bulls to gore and lions to devour. Others were set, were covered with tar and set on fire as human torches to light up the pagan gardens and temples. It was during that time, that age of the martyrs, that 200 year period, six million Christians lost their lives. But it was also during that time, and here's what I want you to hear, that the church grew. Isn't that crazy? Time when the, the, the church is being persecuted the most, more people are coming to Christ. Why? Because they're being crushed. But as they're being crushed, they're giving off this sweet aroma. In fact, this is documented. As Christians there in Rome, would be lined up to go into the Colosseum where they would face either gladiators or they would face lions 
or other animals that would tear them apart. And it was crazy. And this is how demented Rome was. I mean, picture a Colosseum that, that could hold you know, 20 plus, 30 plus thousand people packed to the guilds like we would pack out a football game today. And they're there to watch Christians get torn to pieces. They're there to watch Christians being made sport of by, by the gladiators and brutal, brutally killed. And these Christians would be lined up to go in one after the other. But as they're lined up, they're singing praises to God. Their praises are drowning out the screams of their brothers and sisters who are being mauled to death. And it's so powerful. It's such a sweet aroma that there's documentation of people in the stands getting up out of the stands and going and getting lined to join them. Because the witness was so powerful that they're like, I want what those people have, even if it means they, they know where they're going and I, I want to be a part of that. There's an amazing, amazing true story of the pastor of the church in Smyrna who uh, was pastoring a few years after this was written. His name was Polycarp. If you don't know about Polycarp, I encourage you to do a little research on his life. But he was the last to be discipled by the Apostle John who wrote this letter. And Polycarp was 86 years old and he knew that they were coming for him. But he was not afraid. Yet at the urging of his friends, he fled the city of Smyrna and they caught up to him at a nearby town and when they saw, his captors saw that, they, that he was 86 years old, they didn't want to kill him. And they said, just say Caesar is Lord, and so we, we don't have to kill you. But he wouldn't. They even told him, you don't have to mean it. Just say it, and we'll let you go free. But Polycarp refused. He prayed, or he asked if he could pray before they took him away. And he spent a couple hours. They said, okay. He spent a couple hours praying for the church, praying for the believers, praying for those who arrested him. And then they brought Polycarp to the arena. And because, again, he was so old and loved, they again asked him, just simply say, Caesar is Lord. You don't have to mean it. Just say it. But he wouldn't. He responded in this way. He said, the Lord has been faithful to me for 86 years. How can I deny him now? Angered, the governor ordered him to be set on fire. So they tie him to a post, and the amazing thing is after they tie him to the post, to this wooden post, and they set the wood ablaze, the fire arches up over the, the post and wouldn't burn him. So it's like it's just this, this flame burning over top of him, but it wouldn't burn him. The governor was so angered. He told the guard to pierce him through with his spear. So he drives his spear into him. Blood comes shooting out and extinguishes the fire. True story. I am not making this up. Again, outraged, the governor said, I will feed you to the beast. And Polycarp responded, bring on the beast. I think by now he's getting some confidence, right? Like God's in this, you know, I'm not burning up. And the governor said to Polycarp, don't make me reignite the fire. And Polycarp said this to him, you threaten me with fire that burns for a moment, and yet you forget the fire of hell that never burns out. As they moved forward to light it again, Polycarp prayed, thanking the Lord that he was accounted worthy to be a martyr and asking that he would be faithful unto death the very thing that Jesus wrote to the church that he pastored. What a testimony. The effects of his martyrdom on that day brought many to faith in Christ, helped the believers stand strong in the face of the persecution. So we see here what Jesus exhorts, do not fear Let's see what he promises. He says, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
If Smyrna had a website, its slogan under their name might have been faithful unto death. Or maybe it would have been the church that is ready to die for Jesus. I wonder how many new members they would get with a slogan like that, right? <laughs> Jesus said, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. The word crown here in the Greek, it's the speaks of this, not, not a royal crown, not a diadem crown, but it was the Stephanus crown. It was the victor's crown. It was the crown that they would get. It was really just a wreath that they would put on the heads of those who won an Olympic race or won some type of Olympic battle. It was a victor's crown that Jesus was referring to here. It's saying that you've endured, that you've overcome Paul the Apostle said this about his life. I am ready to be poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all of those who love his appearing. I love that. Hey, are you, are you looking for and in love with and excited about the coming of Jesus? There's a crown for you. It was a victor's crown. Again, Paul would say this about his life. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ be magnified in my body, whether in life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The, the victor's crown. Those who stand. Be faithful, he says, unto death. And he also promises the escape of the second death. Look at verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What is this talking about? Well, turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. We see this mentioned in two passages here. The first is in verse 6. It says, blessed is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. You see, the first death is when we die physically. And should the Lord tarry and the rapture of the church not take place while well, we are alive, we'll experience that physical death, our body shutting down. I just did a funeral on Friday up in Oregon for a good friend of mine who, just 60 years old, out of the blue, perfect health, dies of a massive heart attack. His body shut down. His heart stopped. That's the first death. The second death, though, is when we're separated from God for all of eternity. Those who take part in the resurrection, those who are believers in Jesus, they won't taste that. They won't take part of that. Again, in verse 12, Jesus says, And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each according to his works. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life who was cast into the lake of fire takes part in that second death. You know, it's been said, if you're born just once, you're going to die twice. You die physically, and you experience the second death, the death of being separated from God. But if you're born twice, born physically and born again, you give your life to Jesus, you only die once. When this body, when this body ends here on earth, it's, it's just a passing. You breathe your last breath here on planet earth and you breathe your next breath in heaven, in God's presence. You'll escape the second death. And so as we close tonight, I have this question. Are you, are you sure? Do you know? that you're going to escape the second death? 
The only way you can know that is if you've given your heart to Jesus. The only way to escape this judgment is to come to Jesus who took God's judgment upon himself when he went to the cross so that you and I could be saved. As we wrap up tonight and we look at this church that went through much persecution, there's three things that I think we can take away tonight from this passage is when we, what, what times of tribulation do for us? Well, number one, we see Jesus in a fresh way. When you're going through great difficulties, that's when Jesus shows up in your life in a way that you've maybe never seen him before. He shows up as the one who conquered death. He, he shows up like he said to Paul and says, my grace is sufficient and my power is gonna be made perfect in your weakness. Jesus was revealing himself to this church in a fresh way in the time of their difficulty. Another thing that times of tribulation do for us is they also, they give us the opportunity to comfort one another. Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians, that, that we're able to comfort one another with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. That when we're trusting in Christ in the midst of, of times of persecution and difficulty, it can have a, a contagious effect upon others. And when we've gone through difficulties, it allows us, it gives us a, a compassion, a relatability for those who are going through difficulties. I mean, when you hear, if you've had a root canal, and a friend of you, a friend of yours says, oh, I got, I'm going to the I'm having a root canal. If you've gone through that, you're like, I will pray for you. I know what that's like. If you've battled cancer and you've been able to, you know, overcome it and you hear somebody else in the church has cancer, you're praying for them because you know how radical that can be and how difficult chemo and radiation and some of those things, you know, can be. And so there's a compassion there's a connectedness. There's a, uh, there's a comfort. All you ladies who have gone through long labor, and you hear of a, a gal in the church who's going through long labor, and you're like praying for them, because you know what that's like. You know, the ladies that had a two-hour labor, it's like, what's the big deal, you know? She's praying, but, but those of you who have had long labor, oh, you know, you know what that's like. There, there's a compassion, there's a connectedness, and so we're able to comfort one another. And it also, the times of tribulation give us the opportunity, number three, to diffuse the fragrance of Christ. Again, when would, when would that spice give off that, fragrant smell of the myrrh when it was crushed, when it was crushed. And so guys, when we go through our times of crushing, we need to see it and understand it, that, that God's allowing it because oftentimes it's in those moments of crushing that we, when we keep our eyes on Jesus, that we can give off of that fragrance of Christ that the world needs to smell. You've heard me say this before. I don't think the world around us, that the unsaved world, I don't think they're impressed when the Christian you know, catches the, the touchdown to win the Super Bowl. And afterwards, the announcer is like, you know, that was amazing. What do you have to say? And say, oh, first of all, I just want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we're going to Disneyland. I, I don't think that, that the world goes, I think I should become a Christian. Wow. But when the guy drops the pass that would have won the Super Bowl, and afterwards, the announcer is like, you know, hey, I mean, that was what that was tragedy wow you know how are you feeling and and the guy says well you know first of all yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna remember that probably for the rest of my life but but i know this football does not define me my life is defined by my relationship to, with jesus and there's a lot more things that are more important than than football i think that the unbeliever looks at that and goes okay that guy has something i don't have when we're crushed we have that opportunity to give off that fragrance 
of Jesus.